So today we're going to be talking about um, integrative treatment options for migraine. This is something I talk to my patients about pretty much every single day. And I personally have an interest in this because I myself have suffered from migraines since I was a kid um, and have personally had some experience with some of these options. And I have found them to be really helpful in terms of helping to prevent and reduce my headache frequency, which is really nice. And so I can speak personally about some experiences I've had, but also um, with relationship to the patients that I've seen. So um, as I mentioned, this is a really common topic. We talk about this all the time. There are a lot of different reasons why people will search or seek out integrative medicine options. Some of the more common reasons why people look into these particular options are um, maybe a family friend had recommended it to them, a provider had recommended it to them, they want to improve their immune function, energy, reduce stress, help improve job attendance. But some of the more common reasons why people seek out complementary and integrative medicine is actually because they may be on a lot of different medications for their migraines and they're either not achieving optimal headache control or they're having too many side effects or side effects that are um, unable to be tolerated or they're just on too many medications and they're looking for something else. And I think those are the top reasons why a lot of patients will come to me and ask if there are any other options for their headache treatments. Um, and I just wanna reintroduce myself because a lot of people just started joining in. Uh, welcome, my name is Dr. Anna Pace. I am an assistant professor of neurology and a headache medicine specialist at Mount Sinai in New York. Um, welcome to all of you people from Utah, Colorado, Alabama, Maryland, Tennessee. This is great. Really excited to have you guys here. Welcome. Um, so we're talking a little bit about complementary and integrative medicine treatments for headache. We talked a little bit about some of the more common reasons why people choose to seek these particular treatments out. And I'd like to talk a little bit about the most common uh, integrative treatment options that I speak about with my patients and also have really great scientific evidence behind it, which is great. Um, so some of the more common ones and ones we'll talk about today are things like nutraceuticals. So those are vitamins, minerals, herbal supplements, yoga, tai chi, um, mindfulness and meditation, as well as biofeedback. And then we'll talk a little bit about acupuncture. Now there are a lot of complementary and integrative medicine options for headache. These are just you know, a handful of ones that have a lot of scientific evidence. So um, if you guys have any questions about others further, please feel free to let me know. So just to start off in terms of nutraceuticals, probably the most common uh, vitamin that we use for migraine prevention is actually magnesium. So interestingly enough, what we think is that people with migraine have low pockets of magnesium in their brain. And this is something that we're not really able to measure in the blood like we would do for any other blood tests. Um, but magnesium actually has some involvement in the way in which the brain becomes more hyper excitable during the migraine process. So um, migraine, excuse me, magnesium can help to prevent waves of what we call cortical spreading depression, which is just the fancy way of describing the cellular changes that happen as a result of having a migraine. Um, magnesium is really great for patients who have aura especially, um, and it can also help reduce the release of some of the excitatory or inflammatory chemicals that are released in the brain when you have a migraine. Um, two formulations of magnesium citrate and oxide are probably the most commonly used. The most common side effects of this actually is a little bit of loose stool. So if you have constipation, it's actually a really great option. Um, if you don't have constipation, which most of my patients do not, I often recommend the glycinate formula. It's a little bit gentler on the stomach and it's a little bit easier to take. And the usual dose that we recommend is about 400 to 600 milligrams a day. Um, alternative, uh, Separately, if you have an acute migraine and say, for example, you go to the emergency room or you go to a headache center, you can actually receive magnesium sulfate through your IV and that has been shown to be very helpful to break migraines, which is nice. The next vitamin that we'll talk about is riboflavin or B2. Um, this is a vitamin that is required for energy production and also 
for cellular function. The dosing can range anywhere from 25 milligrams to up to 400 milligrams. And as far as we're aware, based on this, the studies, there hasn't been any major side effects related to this. Probably the most common one that I hear from patients is it makes your urine a little bit more fluorescent appearing or a highlighter color. Completely normal, it's just your kidneys clearing out your riboflavin, but it is something a little bit interesting when you first realize that it's happening. Um, and B2 on its own is actually a little bit fluorescent E in the way in which it looks. Um, it has really great evidence for migraine. I have a lot of patients who take both magnesium and riboflavin together. It can be very helpful using both instead of one or the other. Um, Feverfew is another uh, herbal supplement that has been used for migraine prevention. We think it has some anti-inflammatory properties, and so that is the reason why we think it can be helpful for migraine. Um, the dose is around 6, 6.25, three times a day. So on the one hand, taking something three times a day is kind of hard to do, um, but I do have patients who do use this. Now, the trials have been kind of mixed. So there are some that say it's actually really helpful, and others are saying maybe not as helpful as we think it could be. Some of the more common side effects with fever fuel are a little bit more related to your GI system. So bloating, nausea, um, a little bit of gassiness as well. And if you chew the leaves raw, as opposed to taking the supplement, it can cause a little bit of sores in your mouth and a little bit of mouth irritation. So if you are considering using the fever few, I would probably recommend using the supplement as opposed to actually chewing the leaves. Um, and the other thing that's important to mention is the fever few is not safe to use in pregnancy. Um, CoQ10 is another one I commonly get asked about. So CoQ10 is something that is actually naturally produced in the body. Um, it has a role, again, in energy production in a similar way to riboflavin and feverfew. It also has some antioxidant properties. The dose for this would be about 100 milligrams three times a day. Some of the more common side effects would be diarrhea, um, feeling tired, a little bit of nausea. But overall, CoQ10 actually is pretty well tolerated. Um, can be very helpful for migraine prevention. The one thing that I would mention about CoQ10 that could be relevant is that certain patients who are on blood thinners, especially Coumadin, for example, there is an interaction with CoQ10 and Coumadin. So it'd be important, and I will stress this multiple times during this Facebook Live, it's really important before you consider using any of these integrative options that you speak to your doctor first to make sure that it's an appropriate um, treatment option for you, that there are no interactions with any other medications or treatments you're currently receiving, and to make sure that it's safe. Um, some of the other natural compounds and vitamins that we have used and there have some evidence are things like melatonin. So melatonin commonly is used for people who have issues with sleeping, and melatonin is naturally produ produced in the body as well. There's some data for melatonin helping people with cluster headache as well as migraine, and the interesting thing about melatonin is if your headaches are somehow related to lack of sleep, um, being able to improve your sleep with melatonin on its own can help with your headaches, but melatonin separately can also help, which is nice. So you get a two for one. Um, vitamin D, there are a couple of studies related to vitamin D. They're a little bit mixed, but overall we do recommend in general, if you have a low level of vitamin D that you do supplement vitamin D. Um, there's one study for vitamin E specifically for people who have headaches around their period or menstrually related migraines. Um, it is one study, so it's not as robust as some of these other studies that have been done for things like magnesium and riboflavin, for example. Um, but this particular study has shown that it can help reduce the light and sound sensitivity or a little bit of nausea that you can get with your headaches around your period. Um, and one of the other things I do want to reiterate about the nutraceuticals specifically is that just because it's natural doesn't necessarily mean it's safe. And the regulatory um, you know, systems that exist for migrant, for vitamins are not the same as there are for medicine. Um, so again, it's really important to discuss with your doctor before you start any supplements to determine that they're safe to take and that there are no interactions. And obviously you want to be able to use vitamins that have some scientific backing behind it. So of the vitamins that we've talked about, magnesium probably has the most robust evidence, as is riboflavin, CoQ10 and fever feel kind of a little bit behind there. I do want to briefly bring up essential oils because this is something that my patients ask all of the time. Um, there are, there's very minimal data for this, but there are two 
um, particular oils that come up a lot, lavender and peppermint. And some of you guys may have actually used this before. I have used this before. Um, the one study for peppermint was using it topically, so kind of taking the oil and rubbing it on your temples, kind of at the forehead or any area that was feeling painful. And that can be very helpful, not just for migraine, but also for tension headache. And then lavender, the study that was um, conducted for lavender involved actually inhaling the smell. Um, and so that alone can also help reduce stress, but also can help reduce your migraine as well. Now, there were one or two trials for each of these things, so just keep that in mind. Um, but it is something to think about, and again, a question I get asked about all the time. Okay, so to switch gears a little bit to yoga, um, I love yoga, yoga is great. Um, it is a mind-body therapy um, that has been around for a very long time, and it can be helpful to treat migraines as well as help reduce the disability from migraines. Now, there are a lot of different kinds of yoga. Some of the more common ones that are used for migraine are uh, hatha yoga or restorative yoga. Now, the reason why these can be helpful is because they're a little bit slower paced, um, really focuses on the breathing in between poses, kind of slow movements. It's not as intense as, say, hot yoga, for example. And so for a lot of my patients who either have some difficulty with exercise, maybe they have their migraines are triggered by vigorous exercise, being able to do something like yoga or hatha yoga can be really helpful because it helps get you moving without necessarily triggering headaches, which is obviously a good thing. Um, there are a lot of benefits of yoga. It not only can help improve your headaches and also reduce the disability from your headaches, but it can improve coordination, improves flexibility, it reduces stress, it can improve your mood. Um, it also can help reduce muscle tightness and tension, and it, help can, and it can help reduce anxiety as well, and improve sleep. And all of those things we know can be related to migraines as well. If you're not sleeping well, you're anxious, you have a lot of stress, um, you have neck tightness or muscle tightness, all of these things can contribute to having more frequent migraine attacks. And so if there's something that we can do that can help reduce a lot of those things, I think that would be really helpful. Um, with yoga, I think, practically speaking, obviously we always think of yoga as maybe downward dog or some of the inverted type of poses. Most of my patients, I recommend just avoid those because having your head prolonged upside down can be really painful. Um, but doing even chair yoga for some of my older patients, they really enjoy that. And especially stretches related to the neck, I find practically to be really helpful, especially for people who are sitting at a computer all day or in an office or who are looking at their phones a lot. Um, that strain on your neck can really cause a lot of muscle tightness, which could create pain in the neck, towards the back of the head, towards the front of the head. So being able to use these stretches, especially intermittently at work or in your chair, can be really helpful. Um, can also be really helpful for children and adolescents as well. So that's another thing to think about. Um, some patients who may want to be careful about doing yoga or at least talk to their doctor, especially before they start yoga, or anyone who has severe osteoporosis, they have a history of blood clots, maybe if they also have low blood pressure, or if they have very significant spine disease, either scoliosis or disc disease, always make sure you talk to your doctor first before you start any yoga practice. And if you do go to an actual class, definitely bringing up your medical history and your concerns with your yoga teacher is really helpful. That way he or she can show you some modifications for certain poses that are safer to use. And the same goes for pregnancy as well. To piggyback on yoga, we can talk a little bit about Tai Chi. So Tai Chi um, also involves some gentle movements has to do with a lot of breath work and a lot of flow. It's really involving the philosophy of balancing energy in your body, the yin and the yang. Um, it can be very helpful to reduce chronic pain, and there's a lot of data for that. It can also improve well-being and reduce stress. So I think you guys are kind of getting the theme here about a lot of these mind-body therapies and reducing stress. I find clinically that Tai Chi can be really helpful for some of my older patients who, are, again, are not able to tolerate vigorous exercise. Um, and because it's slower paced, you're standing up, there are no inversions, it can be very helpful for relaxation as well. The other thing that Tai Chi is really great for is actually improving balance. So for anyone who suffers from any type of dizziness or vestibular symptoms with their migraines or have vestibular migraine, this actually might be a really good option um, because it can help improve your balance. Okay, moving right along here. Um, thank you guys all for commenting and welcome. 
Um, we're going to be talking a little bit more about some other complementary and integrative medicine options. So the next one on the list is going to be mindfulness and meditation. Um, so I'm sure you guys have probably heard so much about mindfulness and meditation in the news and on YouTube podcasts. There, it's really all over right now, which is nice. Um, but what exactly is mindfulness? So mindfulness really is about being present in the moment um, and kind of taking the time to be aware of your surroundings and where who you are, what you are doing, um, without any judgment. Now, I'm sure I do this all the time, but you may be walking down the street, you have your headphones on, you're listening to music, you're checking your email on your phone, you're trying to cross the street, and you're thinking about all of the tasks and things that you have to do when you get home. So multitasking is such a big part of our lives now, and it's very hard not to multitask, especially given the amount of technology that we have, where we're doing multiple things at the same time. So mindfulness really focuses on allowing you to become more aware of the present moment as you are doing one thing and trying to center you in that way. Um, mindfulness is really about slowing down. It's not necessarily about clearing your mind because that's very difficult to do. It's more kind of focusing your thoughts on one particular thing at a time and acknowledging certain things. So you can do mindfulness when you're eating, you can do it when you're walking, you can do it when you are at work, when you're on the subway, when you're traveling, when you're exercising, when you're resting, there's always a good time for mindfulness. And the same goes for meditation. Um, mindfulness and meditation kind of go hand in hand and meditation involves a lot more kind of deep breathing as well as mindfulness. Um, and the best part about both of these things is there really aren't any side effects. They're all both really great for you. They can help reduce stress. They can help improve your mood. Um, there are a lot of mindfulness and meditation exercises you can do before sleep if you feel like you have difficulty sleeping or you have insomnia. Um, and it can also help reduce anxiety and stress. And again, bringing up the same concept of reducing stress, improving well-being. I think this is really crucial for people who have migraines because having migraines can be really stressful on its own, separate from all of the life stresses that we have going on on a day-to-day -day basis. So having an outlet to be able to channel your stress and kind of work on um, centering yourself and focusing on the moment and taking it in, I think is really helpful and can be really powerful for migraine prevention and also improving your quality of life in general. So I recommend mindfulness and meditation to people even if they don't have headaches because I think it just really helps you feel good um, and helps, helps you get through the day, especially if it's particularly difficult at work, at home, at school. Um, okay, almost done here. So the next thing I'd like to talk about is biofeedback. So kind of piggybacking a little bit on the mindfulness and meditation, biofeedback is something that has excellent evidence for migraine. So if you had to pick one of these things that you would consider that you'd want to talk to your doctor about, biofeedback is a really good one. So what exactly is biofeedback? Basically, what happens is you would go in to see a biofeedback therapist who's licensed and trained to do this, and you are watching certain bodily changes that happen on a monitor. If you're hooked up, sometimes they'll put a little sticker on your arm or maybe on your forehead, um, and it helps you kind of see exactly some of the changes that happen as a result of, for example, if you're under stress or you're in pain. So when you, are, you have stress or when you're in pain, um, in your body, you may notice that your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure may go up, you may sweat, um, your muscles may tighten, and all of these things are changes that happen as a result of the experience that you're having. So during biofeedback, you're able to see those changes on a monitor, and then the therapist can actually show you how to exert a little bit of control over that. Um, so that way you can actually help manage these changes and help reduce stress and anxiety. Um, the cool thing about this is you actually get immediate feedback when you're doing it. So as you are working on your techniques, your deep breathing, some of the other um, biofeedback techniques that they will teach you, you can see on the monitor that your heart rate goes down, the sweating starts to decrease, your muscles begin to relax a little bit. There's really great immediate feedback. Um, and it can be very helpful for patients, especially who have a lot of anxiety during their attacks or feeling like they have anxiety as a result of how many frequent attacks that they're having. Um, Biofeedback is a really great option. And then finally, I do want to talk a little bit about acupuncture. And acupuncture is another one that I am asked about pretty frequently. Um, it is traditional Chinese medicine, and the goal is really to help balance, balance energy in your life, or qi. Um, 
they use a lot of different small needles. They'll place them at various different parts of your body called meridians. Um, and acupuncture has been shown to increase the release of serotonin, dopamine, and endorphins and other chemicals that help to treat chronic pain. Um, it can be very helpful in preventing episodic migraine. Um, it's usually very well tolerated. Some of the side effects that you may notice if you do go to acupuncture, you may notice a little bit of a warm, tingling kind of sensation when they put the needle in, and sometimes they may twist the needle ever so slightly. That's normal, and that's something that they expect for you to see. Um, and you may have a little bit of soreness, depending, or you may have relaxation and fall asleep on the table. Um, but otherwise, it's very well tolerated. One thing I would mention about acupuncture is that it may not necessarily be the best if someone is on blood thinners or has a bleeding disorder, because you may have increased risk of bleeding. Um, and again, pregnant women really should definitely talk to their doctor before using acupuncture and also speak to the acupuncturist as well.